Uh, hello, thanks for coming watching this video today. Uh, the topic that we have today, like I've written, is hemorrhoids. So uh, let's start, as we always do, with the definition. So the definition of hemorrhoids is engorgement of the venous plexus in the anal canal. So uh, the best way to start is going to be with the anatomy of the anal canal. Uh, now the anal canal, so we, I have a di diagram here of the anal canal. And um, the most important part of the anal canal is going to be this line that I'm drawing here. That's called the dentate or also known as the pectinate line. And um, this is really, really important uh, because uh, early on in embryology, uh, there, this, uh, there, it's a combination of two different embryological parts. Uh, above the pectinate line, um, so let me zoom in here. Above the pectinate line, uh, you have the uh, endoderm. And below the pectinate line, you have the ectoderm. Now, this, uh, this pen isn't really working too well, so what I'm going to just do is just uh, draw a little uh, table. Uh, and so what we'll do is we can just draw a table and we'll write above for above the pectinate line and below for below the pectinate line. And then we'll just kind of compare and contrast uh, the different features above and below. So uh, the first thing is above is going to be derived from the endoderm of the um, uh, embryological uh, tissue and below is going to be derived from the ectoderm of the embryological tissue. And so uh, what this also means is that the type of cells are going to be different. So in the endoderm you have the columnar uh, cells and in the uh, uh, sorry, not in the derm, but above the pectinate line and below the pectinate line, you have the squamous cells. And just as a side note, this also uh, is links into pathology related to cancer. So generally, above the pectinate line, you get adenocarcinomas, and below the pectinate line, you get squamous carcinomas. And this is just because of the histology. Uh, now, since uh, the above the pectinate line is derived from the endoderm, um, there isn't no necessarily somatic sensation. So you, there is no pain above the pectinate line. However, uh, below the pectinate line, um, this is going to be pretty much your skin. And so your skin has uh, somatic sensation. And so this is going to be, you will feel pain. And primarily the uh, nerve that this sense, uh, sense goes through is the uh, pedendal nerve. So the pedendal nerve is the nerve involved in feeling this pain. Um, when it comes to pathology that we're going to talk about today with hemorrhoids, um, it is, I guess one key feature is hemorrhoids that are above the pe uh, pectinate line uh, oftentimes result in prolapse, whereas hemorrhoids below the pectinate line uh, result in thrombosis. And so since we're already kind of jumped the gun here, um, uh, hemorrhoids above the pectinate line are also known as internal hemorrhoids, and below the pectinate line are called external hemorrhoids. So that's kind of a... Um, addition of what we're going to talk about later. Okay, so now uh, what we'll talk about is the definite causes or the etiology of um, hemorrhoids. Um, the first etiology is going to be related to defecation because that's the primary uh, you know, function of the uh, anal canal. So generally, uh, patients who have low fiber diets, uh, what will happen is because they don't have enough fiber in their diet, uh, they tend to become constipated. And when the patient becomes constipated, uh, they strain uh, very heavily, and this can lead to increased abdominal pressure, and it can engorge the um, via the veins of the uh, anal canal. And we'll talk about those veins specifically in a little bit. Also, constant diarrhea can agitate the the, the walls of the anal canal, and that can lead to this type of engorgement of the um, veins. And also, uh, believe it or not, prolonged lavatory sitting. And uh, these are generally uh, people who, when they use the toilet, um, they end up reading a book for hours or whatever. Um, this can block the flow around the uh, anal canal, and this is one of the causes for hemorrhoids. So if you're one of those people, um, you might want to uh, have, you know, find another place to read a book. Um, also, um, trauma can lead to it, and even age. Uh, as you get older, some of the support structures tend to weaken up. Um, besides defecation, there are, there are some secondary causes, so other pathologies that can lead to um, uh, hemorrhoids. Uh, the first, first is going to be a hypertonic sphincter. And again, when a patient has a hypertonic sphincter, it makes them push harder while they're defecating. And then this is, can cause increased abdominal pressure, which can lead to engorgement of those 
um, anal vessels. Uh, pregnancy can also lead to it, and again, pregnancy uh, a lot of times is causing increased abdominal pressure, and that's what will cause. And of course, portal to hypertension, you know, uh, oftentimes caused by liver cirrhosis. Again, backup flow, and then of course we know portal hypertension can also cause esophageal varices, anal varices, and even the umbilical uh, varices. So um, that's just your general causes. Uh, now we can go back into different types, and we're kind of, um, and when we're talking about types. I've kind of already alluded to it earlier. Um, so here, let's take a diagram of the. Uh, here we go. So um, as you can see, here's the pectinate line, and um, hemorrhoids that are above uh, the pectinate line, so such as this one here, are going to be internal hemorrhoids. And hemorrhoids, so this is the pectinate line, so below here and uh, uh, outside the anal canal is going to be your external hemorrhoids. So that's how they're uh, divided. And so uh, when we're discussing um, hemorrhoids today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just make it in the form of a table. So I'll put an internal on one side um, and external on the other side here. So um, we know the veins are involved, so it's important to go over which uh, actual veins we have um, in the canal. Uh, the in the internal area, we have something called anal cushions. Uh, and in the external, we, have, we just have circumferential veins. And so here, um, you know, right here, I'm kind of drawing a uh, diagram of the actual blood supply of the internal and external canal. And so what you can see is, you can see this plexus is one, two, three. These three plexuses are the anal cushions uh, that are found here in the internal canal. And out here, in the external here, this is the circumferential vein. And so um, th this is the major site of pathology when we start talking about um, uh, hemorrhoids. And so uh, the one right here is called the uh, left uh, lower uh, plexus of veins or the left lower anal cushion. Uh, the one down here is called the right posterior anal cushion. And the one on the top is called the um, right anterior anal cushion. And so right away, since this is anterior, you know your genitalia is on this side. And this is kind of your uh, backside there. Uh, so, um, so these are your th three plexuses that commonly get engorged. And so since th this is the main locations, uh, generally what you have is you have um, hemorrhoids. Uh, you get, second, let me see, okay, here we go. So you get um, kind of, so I, what I've drawn here is, if you think of this as a clock, this being 12 o'clock, uh, you'll get, generally get one hemorrhoid at the three o'clock position you'll get one hemorrhoid at the 7 o'clock position and 11 o'clock position. So the, the, the thing you want to remember is 3, 7, and 11 o'clock position is where you generally get the uh, hemorrhoids bulging. Um, however, there are some minor tufts in between. So in between these, uh, these, plex these main plexuses, these are minor tufts. And these minor tufts can have hemorrhoids. So it's not necessarily 3, 7, 11, but those are the most common and those are the largest. Uh, so uh, what we can do now, oh, before I continue, um, mixed hemorrhoids is basically when you have a hemorrhoid that starts off an internal, crosses the pectin line, goes into external. So if it goes into both, that's called a mixed uh, hemorrhoid. Okay, so um, what we'll do now is we can, uh, we'll continue this uh, chart that we started and we'll look at the different grades of internal hemorrhoids. Uh, yeah, internal hemorrhoids, since they prolapse, they have different grades based upon how much they prolapse. So uh, the first one here is grade one, uh, and in grade one there is no prolapse. So you can see there's like just these two little like nuggets there, and so there is no real prolapse. And then uh, on the right hand side we have a picture there, uh, and you can see uh, when you visibly look at the anus, there's really nothing uh, there to see from the outside. Um, in two, you can see that the uh, hemorrhoid is bulging out, so kind of highlighted in green there. However, it, it's bulging out, um, and, and generally what happens when, when they uh, defecate, it will come down, however, it'll spontaneously regress. So you have spontaneous regression is a key uh, feature of grade two. And you can see here um, that the grade two is, uh, you can actually see, kind of see visibly. So grade three, I've, I've kind of highlighted it there. In grade three, um, whenever they defecate, um, the prolapse will increase however with digitally they can push it back in and so you can see here it's 
you know, it's protruding much more than grade two. So digitally, they can pull back to grade three. Now, the uh, final most severe grade is grade four. And so you can see it's a whole thing bulging up there. And, you know, in grade four, the, 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 distinguishing, the, the distinguishing feature between grade three and grade four is if you apply pressure up this way, it won't reduce. It'll just stay up. So grade three, you, you could manually uh, regress it. However, in grade four, uh, it's no way to regress it. So, and you can see how uh, big that is. And you can just see as you go, as you go down, it's become bigger and bigger and more visible. Uh, so that's uh, internal. Uh, we can go back to external. So uh, we know that external um, is in the circumferential vein. And so they can occur anywhere. They don't have the same 3, 7, 11 o'clock thing. Um, the biggest problem with external is thrombosis. And so here's an image here um, of an external hemorrhage and you can see the kind of blue discoloration. And so that is thrombosis right there. So you can see that. And what happens oftentimes is it begins to uh, erode the skin and that can eventually lead to bleeding, uh, bright red blood. And so, so that's a common uh, feature of uh, external hemorrhoids. And um, when it becomes chronic, uh, they can actually produce skin tags and so you can see skin tags here. And the problem with skin tags is there's many crevices. So you have like one here, there, you know, we have like three, four, and a long one there. And so what can happen is uh, hygiene becomes an issue. So when they defecate, uh, the fecal matter gets trapped in this area. That can lead to intense itching and, and of course, uh, infections as well, and erosion. Okay, um, so as you can see, you know, external hemorrhoids isn't, as bad as uh, internal hemorrhoids because internal hemorrhoids does have that prolapse and the prolapse can lead to different complications. So we'll kind of talk about that right now. So um, when you have a prolapse, uh, you know, what can happen is um, oftentimes you can get the external sphincter can compress it. And so when the external sphincter compresses it, you get decreased venous return and uh, that leads to strangulation. And so once you have strangulation of the actual prolapse, piece, I guess you could say, um, this can either lead to fibrosis of that piece or gangrene of that piece. And so, of course, if you have gangrene, that's going to be much more serious. You need to do uh, surgery. And if you have fibrosis, uh, I guess it's not as serious. But um, once you have strangulation, what can also occur is you can have that piece ulcerate or it can thrombose. And if it ulcerates, uh, if it thromboses, that can lead to pain. And if it ulcerates, that can lead to bleeding. And this is a common symptoms of um, hemorrhoids is pain and bleeding, and even pruritus uh, as well. But that just, that's more due to just kind of some of the mucosa going out and causing uh, itchiness. So uh, generally, that's going to be your complication related to uh, prolapse, especially if it's been there for a long time and it gets uh, trapped into the sphincter. Okay, so how do we um, diagnose it? Uh, so let's kind of extend that there. So, th so we're done with that. Uh, so now we're going to move on to diagnosis. Um, first of all, you're going to want to do a visual inspection. Um, and you do a visual inspection of by first putting the patient in the lateral left decubitus position. Um, and generally, if they have an external uh, hemorrhoid, you can see it right away. Um, however, while you're over there, um, you do want to try to rule out abscesses and fissures. Uh, and this is because many patients will come in saying, I have a hemorrhoid, uh, but it's not a hemorrhoid. It's just, it's just a common condition that they know of. They might just have a fissure or an abscess. Um, after the visual inspection is done, uh, you want to proceed to a digital rectal exam. Uh, and so in a digital rectal exam, so it's, okay, all right. in a digital rectal exam, uh, you're, the first thing you want to check is for the tone of the uh, anal canal. Of the anal canal. Uh, and you also want to look uh, for any tenderness. And one thing you do want to remember that uh, internal hemorrhoids oftentimes are not palpable. So just because you can't palpate something doesn't mean you can rule out hemorrhoids. And so obviously if that's the case, then we're gonna have to do also do an endoscopy, also known as protoscopy. Uh, and what you generally will find is like a bulging uh, blue veins. Uh, and so if you see that, then you pretty much diagnose internal hemorrhoids uh, at that point. You, there's, there's no really need to do any more investigations, labs, imaging. Um, sometimes if it's been chronic or if it's you know, really, really bloody, you can do a CBC uh, through that anemia, but that's very, very rare. So not commonly done. So uh, once you diagnose it, of course, we want to go into treatment. Um, so uh, we can talk about that. Uh, the first line of treatment is going to be conservative treatment. And you're going to want to do that uh, whenever it's uh, stage one. Not, 
the stage one, let's say that. Uh, whenever you have a stage one, you definitely want to start off with conservative. Maybe even stage two, uh, you want to start off with conservative. Uh, and the first step is going to be uh, diet and fiber. Uh, so as soon as you can change their diet, uh, you know, maybe give some fiber supplements, get exercise, that can help uh, some of the symptoms a lot. And actually, uh, it has been shown to actually decrease the uh, hematochesia that they might have. And hematochesia just means uh, blood in the feces. Uh, and with regards to pruritus, which does occur sometimes, uh, oftentimes you can give cream, hydrocortisone uh, is very common, and sits bath is also helpful for them, uh, you know, to kind of alleviate some of the uh, symptomatic uh, issues that's going on. So once you try conservative treatment, uh, and it, you know, if say it doesn't work, um, then you do need to go into minimally invasive uh, treatment. And so minimally invasive is uh, basically any type of procedure that can be done in the OPD clinic, so the outpatient clinic, uh, the, you, you can do it there. The most common one, uh, most popular, is the rubber band ligation. Um, and rubber band ligation can work for stage one, two, or three. Um, however, it doesn't work for four. Um, and so what, what you do in rubber band ligation, so here, here I have a diagram of what happens. Uh, you have this device here called a ligator. Uh, it, you clamp the uh, hemorrhoid and then you push the ligator up above the hemorrhoid to so suck it in and you see this black area here these are rubber bands you take them off and these rubber bands will clamp the hemorrhoid shut and so after a while it'll it stops the blood flow and it just it just come right off so very uh, quick non-invasive painless uh, way to treat the condition so this is the most popular uh, way to do it however there are other options uh, for whatever reasons um, you know, that needs to be done. Uh, one of them being laser photocoagulation, which they use high intensity light beams. Sclerotherapy, where they sclerose the actual uh, hemorrhoid. And finally, you have cryosurgery, where they make it really, really cold. And so you can use this, uh, those three on stage one and stage two, not stage three or four. Um, surgery. Um, surgery is generally reserved for cases where it's stage three or stage four and sometimes two if uh, the conservative management and minimally invasive management didn't work. Um, you also want to do this if uh, they have um, thrombosis. Uh, you want to do this if there's ulceration, uh, if you find any bleeding, or if there's gangrene. So any of those four conditions can on um, automatic surgery. Uh, the common surgeries that are done is um, known as hemorrhoidectomies. So you can have an open or a closed Hemorrhoidectomy, um, these, are, these were pretty effective. They have about a 95% cure rate and infection rates really, really low. However, there is another um, uh, method which is called the stapled hemorrhoidectomy. Um, this has a higher recurrence rate. However, there's less pain and it's a shorter stay. So some patients prefer this. Now, uh, with regards to hemorrhoids, it's a very common condition. And since it's very common, there's many different uh, devices, procedures being developed. So there's definitely many more. Uh, I couldn't get into all of them. And that, that goes with minim minimally invasive as well. Um, there's definitely many more going on. So I uh, hope you enjoyed the discussion. See you in the next video. Thanks.